Hey, welcome to Sweet Home Evangelical Church. I'm Pastor Brian, and uh, oh, it, we're into August, and so we're doing sort of like three different services. Uh, we've got Lawn Chair Church at 9.30 on Sundays, indoor service at 11, and welcome to the online service here today. And uh, let me just open up with a quick word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you that you're with us. We thank you that you're with us all the time, wherever we are. And Lord, I pray that you would open up your word to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when I, when I was a teenager, I loved working for McDonald's. I had so much fun. It was great. And, uh, uh, and I love the story of McDonald's, too. Uh, McDonald, there, was, there were two brothers, Dick and Maurice McDonald. I know, imagine that. And they were actually from New Hampshire, but they moved to California to try to find fame and fortune. And they moved to California in 1930, and they struggled. Of course, it's Great Depression, but they struggled for several years. Finally, they found something that actually was slightly successful. They opened up a drive-in restaurant in Pasadena, California in 1937. And that, that finally they found something that worked okay and was doing well. And in uh, three years later, by 1940, they moved to a bigger location in San Bernardino. Over the years, they changed a bit with the times and they built their business around speed, getting food to the customer quickly. We call it fast food today, right? And then Ray Kroc showed up in 1955. Ray saw Dick and Maurice's operation, and he was impressed. However, Ray Kroc had the vision. He could envision this thing going nationwide. And he just had this big dream, big vision that Dick and Maurice didn't really have. And Ray joined them. He's like, he talked him, himself into being part of the company. And in the first six years, from 1955 to 61, McDonald's uh, exploded. And uh, six years later, there were 500 McDonald's restaurants. And that year, Ray Kroc bought out the McDonald brothers for $2.7 million, which is a lot of money. And the McDonald brothers, they had tried to open up more restaurants, uh, but after almost 20 years of trying, they had 10. The first six years Ray Kroc was there, he had the vision. They went from 10 to 500. And now today there's over 40,000 McDonald's restaurants around the world. Ray was the guy with the vision. Dick and Maurice, wonderful guys, good guys, but they couldn't see it. Ray Kroc had the vision. He could see it in his mind before it actually happened. And today we're talking a little bit about vision. And the question today is what is the vision for the church. What is the vision for our church? And more importantly, what is Jesus's vision for the church, for our church? Uh, we've been in a series here the past uh, couple Sundays, uh, Update Your Prayer Life, which is kind of funny because I, I had this idea of, oh, a while ago, uh, update your prayer life. And uh, during the past couple weeks, uh, my phone has had to go through updates and my computer has had to go through updates. And these things happen and every now and then we just need to, you know, update our prayer life too. And we've kind of, we bounced around a bit, but, you know, mostly, especially two weeks ago, we were looking at the Last Supper with Jesus teaching his disciples there uh, towards the end of the Gospel of John. And Jesus has a, this longer teaching, and at the end of that teaching at the Last Supper, uh, we see a prayer. Uh, Jesus prays, and we see Jesus' prayer and vision for the church. It's not our vision that we want. We want Jesus' vision for the church. And what is it that makes a group of followers of Christ be the kind of people that Jesus prayed for? What is it that makes them the people that God calls them to be? And that's tough to figure out sometimes. Dick and Maurice, wonderful guys, but they, they really couldn't see the vision for how to get from here to there. Ray Kroc, he, he saw it. 
He saw it clearly. And we want to be the kind of church that God has called us to be, the kind of church that has not just our vision, but we have the vision of God, the vision of Christ for what he wants for his church. So, as usual, let's look to see what the Bible has to say about this issue here. And we're going to be in John chapter 17 today, where Jesus prays for the church and what the church is supposed to be. The last two Sundays, the messages were a bit more topical, but today we're, we're digging into chapter 17. So get your Bible, look up John chapter 17, that's where we're going to be. Uh, now, just back up one verse, the last verse of John chapter 16, Jesus says to the disciples, he says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on this earth, you will have trials and sorrows, right? Uh, but take heart because I have overcome the world. When Jesus comes into chapter 17, coming in prayer, he's not coming in a prayer of desperation. He is coming into prayer in confidence. He is coming into prayer acknowledging that he is an overcomer. And he is also coming expressing his confidence in the Father. In John chapter 17, we've got several verses where Jesus makes requests of the Father for the church. Jesus is constantly in prayer, going to God, God the Father, and asking something special for us. And Jesus expresses confidence for you and me. Look at verse 20. He says, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will believe in me through their message. That's us. Verse 21, he says, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. There's a confidence that Jesus has, this, this confidence that Jesus came and he's giving that confidence to us. And he's confident that we will carry out his mission and his message. He, he prays that the Father would help us. 2,000 years ago, Jesus prayed for the church. Jesus prayed, and because he's God, he had the vision, okay? He didn't just pray for a few guys in Jerusalem. He prayed for the church, all churches that exist even today. Jesus prayed for the church all those years ago. Uh, all earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Now, there, Jesus has a two-part purpose of his prayer here in John 17. We're going to focus on the second you know, purpose of his prayer. But the first purpose of his prayer is incredibly interesting. And we'll just touch on that briefly. But Jesus is giving a report back to God the Father on everything he's done. He's kind of, you know, summarizing, here's everything that he was sent to do here on earth. Here's what he did. It's kind of like the end of the month report, end of the year report, people do at work or stuff. Some people... <laughs> They do this uh, with their family in like a, a Christmas letter that they send out to all their family and friends. Uh, here's everything that we did this past year. And, and Jesus is giving that report of, okay, now you wanted me to do this and here's everything that I've done. He's giving this report to God the Father in prayer. In verse four, Jesus says, I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Verse six, I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from the world. Verse 8, I passed on to them the message you gave me. Verse 12, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. Verse 14, I have given them your word. Verse 18, just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. Verse 22, I have given them the glory you gave me. And verse 26, I have revealed you to them and I will continue to do so. Okay, so eight times, eight times in this prayer, Jesus reports back to God the Father, and he says, I did this. You sent me to do this, and I did it, and I checked it off the to-do list here, and, which is amazing. It just kind of gives us this picture of what was important for Jesus' mission here on earth. But the second purpose of the prayer, what we're going to focus on today is Jesus asks that the work 
he started will be continued through the church. Jesus prayed for you and I in that prayer. He asked that the work that he began to do and went to the cross and died for, that this work would continue on down through the centuries and would be actively happening even in the here and now. Okay, so what does Jesus pray for? Uh, we're, we're in, finally, we're going to read the scripture, John 17, verse 13. Jesus said, Now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world, so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word, and the world hates them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but that you would keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into this world, I'm sending them into the world, and I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. I'm praying not only for these disciples, but for also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Wow. I pray that they will be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, that they may be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Okay. So today I got five point message. About half my messages have five points, but you know, that's just how it works. Uh, and so what did Jesus pray for? We got five things here. Number one, Jesus prayed that the church would sense God's glory. He, as he begins to pray, he's praying that, that they would sense the glory of God the Father. In the Old Testament, it talks about, oh, the, the Old Testament uh, with Moses uh, going up on top of Mount Sinai, and just this, this cloud surrounds it, and the glory of the Lord is there, and then Charlton Heston comes down from the, uh, Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, and, and his face is glowing because of the glory of God. And this is Jesus' prayer for the church. Uh, just He says in verse 10, he says, All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. Seven times the word glory or glorified is used in this chapter. All through this chapter, you see the word glory or glorified coming up. The Father is to continue to glorify himself in the church. And Jesus is asking that, the ch that those in the church would sense, would feel, would experience, and know the glory of God. The word glory, it's um, in the Greek. I don't bring out Greek words too much, but the Greek word uh, comes from the Greek word doxa, which I don't pronounce correctly, uh, but that's where we get the word doxology. Remember the, uh, some of you might remember the old song uh, that uh, more traditional churches will sing, that old song, the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow, and that word glory, it means this visible manifestation of the power and glory and radiance of God. In essence, Jesus was praying that God the Father would, would people would sense the glory and the presence and the power and the radiance of God's glory, that the people in years to come will continue to experience God's presence. This is a pray, I, prayer I pray every Sunday morning, that when people show up, they would be able to experience God's presence and God's glory. That's what Jesus prayed for us, that we would experience God's glory. In the Old Testament, we see this, um, oh, in Jerusalem. King Solomon, he builds the temple and they dedicate the temple. And it talks about the glory of God coming down upon the temple. 
in uh, Luke chapter 2, uh, when we, we talk about this at Christmas time. Uh, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord appeared unto them, and the what? The glory of the Lord shone round about them. That's not just coming to a building and having a pleasant experience and the preacher telling a couple jokes and being able to see your friends and stuff. It is, you know, that's good and all, but Jesus' prayer is that we would be able to experience the presence of God. How tragic it is to come to church and miss the presence of God. You aren't coming to church just to hear from uh, some good-looking pastor, right? <laughs> the whole point of coming is to experience the glory of God. You, you, and you're only going to find that if you're looking for it. But this is our prayer on Sundays, and this was Jesus' prayer for the church. He is praying for the church that when you come to the church, when you are the church, that you would experience the glory of God. Number two, he prays that the church would follow the word of God. We see this in several verses here in this uh, chapter. Uh, he says in verse 8, I have passed on to them, the disciples, the message you, God, gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. Okay. You see that? Jesus passed on God's message to his followers, to the disciples there, and they accepted it. Jesus is praying that we would also follow God's word, and, and I tell you, it's a whole lot easier because it's all written down in this book here that we call the Bible, right there. Um, when, when the disciples accepted God's message, it gave them meaning in life. They understood uh, that, that Jesus truly came from heaven, from God the Father. It gave them motivation in life. Oh, this is my purpose here. And, it, and, uh, and they believed that the Father sent Jesus, and it gave them a mission in life. We need to share this. When you really get into God's word, you're going to find your meaning in life. You're going to understand who God is, who Jesus is, what my state is, and why I need Jesus. And you'll understand who, who God is and, and, and who I am in Christ. We're going to be motivated to grow in our relationship with God. And we're going to find the mission of the church, which is to share this message with the world, this message that is literally called good news with a world that desperately needs Jesus. I, I've got a nice four-point message here that I'm going to throw in free, no additional charge here, uh, but uh, Jesus prays that we would follow God's word, and, and he tells us what God's word does for us. God's word uh, separates us from the world. It's what makes us different. At, at the same time, it gives us strength to endure living here. And God's word also saves and sanctifies us. He says in verse 14, I have given them your word and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. God's word separates us from the world. We're supposed to be different than the rest of the world. We have a different value system, and we are not to be like the rest of the world. When we follow God's word, Jesus is praying that we would be strengthened, that we would be able to endure. He says in verse 15, I'm not asking that you take them out of this world, but that you would keep them safe in this world from the evil one. Jesus' prayer and plan for us is not to hide from the world, but that we would have the strength to live in this world. And he also prays that we would be sanctified, that we would be saved, that we would be sanctified, that we would be made holy, that we would be separate to do, uh, set apart to do God's will. Uh, he says in verse 17, and again, verse 19, prays that we would be made holy by the word, by the truth of the word of God. Verse 20, he prays that the sharing of the word of God would save people, which includes us today. Verse 20, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. It is the word of God that separates us from the world. It strengthens us. 
in, in the message we find in the God, uh, God's word, it saves us. And, and you will not find this message anywhere else. There are flashes of spiritual truth in a lot of places, but the only place where you will find it is, is the authority is God's word. And Jesus prayed that we would be devoted to following God's word here on earth. This is why I'm so big on we need to be reading our Bible because we're following God's word. Number three, Jesus prays that the church would be united in love. He says in verse 21, I pray that they would be one just as you and I are one. Whew, that's tough. That's tough. Have you ever had people upset at you and you wonder why? I have. Have you ever said things that uh, you didn't mean to? You kind of, you just weren't thinking. Uh, you said it and you just didn't think, Oh, I didn't even think that would offend someone. I guess I did. Ugh. We are imperfect beings, and we struggle to get along. And then our church, every church, has all kinds of people from all kinds of different backgrounds, and, and we, we all have different ways of thinking, different ways of talking, and it is difficult and it's not always easy to get along with each other. And, but Jesus is praying for the unity of our church. Jesus is praying for the unity of our church, which sounds like it's something that's possible. A church that is un not united, well, that's just plain painful, isn't it? And we want to be a church that's united in love. Why does Jesus say we should be united in love? It says in verse 21, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in the Father, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that, so that the world will believe you sent me. We are united in love so that the world will believe. Jesus expands on this. He says in verse 23, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. The church, our church, is an advertisement for Christianity. When the world looks at our church, will they be able to know by the way we treat one another that Jesus is real? Will they be able to look at our group of followers of Jesus and see that this Jesus we claim changes lives, has really changed our lives? Jesus prays that the church would be united in love, number four. Jesus prays the church would fulfill the mission. He gives us the mission. He's praying that we would fulfill the mission. We call this the Great Commission. Verse 18, Jesus says, Just as you sent me in the world, I am sending them into the world. Jesus prayed to God the Father, Just like you sent me into this world to seek and save the lost, I'm sending my followers into this world on the same mission. Good news is we don't have to die on a cross, okay? That's good stuff. Thank goodness. But Jesus' prayer for us is that we would go to this lost and hurting world and share with them this life-changing message of salvation. Jesus is praying that we would fulfill the mission of growing fully devoted followers of Christ in a world that desperately needs Jesus. Number five... Jesus prays that the church would experience joy. The church would experience joy. Did you know that Jesus is praying that we would have a good time together? I'm not entirely sure Jesus is praying that you would laugh at all my jokes, although, you know, I mean, I, I bring you good stuff here, okay? But Jesus is praying that we would have joy. Uh, Bob and I, we've talked a couple times about how we need to get a, a, a neon sign that says happy hour and turn that on on Sunday mornings. Uh, however, uh, Nancy and my wife, they, they think that's a bad idea. They think it might send a wrong message. <laughs> and they're probably right. But Jesus says in verse 13, he says to God, I'm coming to you. 
I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with my joy. Let me ask you a question. What gives a church the joy of God? It's not just laughing at the preacher's jokes. It is when we sense the presence of God, when we follow the word of God, when we are united in the love of God, and when we go forth on the mission of God, then as a body of believers, we begin to experience the joy of God. This is how Jesus is praying for us, praying for you. Jesus prayed for you, And it says in the scriptures that Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for us. And he continues to pray for you, to pray for us as a church, to pray for the church around the world. That should encourage us in our prayers. Let me pray for you. Lord God, we thank you that you sent Jesus to leave this holy heaven to come to this unholy earth in order to seek and save sinners like me. Lord, we thank you for the work you've done in us. We thank you that you prayed for us and continue to pray for us. Lord, help us to be the church you've called us to be, that we could be committed to following your word, that we could experience your glory, that we could share your love with one another that we would share your message with this world that needs it and that we would experience your joy. Lord God, we pray that your will would be done this day and this week in our lives and in our church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Lord bless you, my friends. Thanks for joining me. Uh, We'll have overtime, I don't know, Tuesday, maybe Monday. uh, And uh, later on this week, we'll do midweek update with Pastor Brian and Donald. And and, uh, so hopefully you can join us either uh, outside at uh, Lawn Chair Church Sundays at 930, inside at 11, or online uh, church here too, pretty much anytime. Hey, we'll see you later. Lord bless you. Bye-bye.